Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. And on today's Top Med Talk, we're going to have a piece taken from the 20th Current Controversies in Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine Conference held in Dingle by Ebpom. Don't forget, of course, you want more details on this podcast. Full show notes are available on topmedtalk.com. Have a listen. It's a delight to, to welcome our first speaker, Ross Kerridge, anaesthetist and associate professor in Newcastle, Australia. Uh, it's always an absolute joy listening to uh, Ross's presentations, uh, some of the most warm and thoughtful presentations I think I've heard at, at Dingle and other conferences. I think it's uh, fair to say Ross has probably been suggesting how we could or should do peroptive medicine for the best part of about 20 years, and I think other places are now finally starting to get the idea. But um, our next speaker, uh, Sol Aronson, uh, who's a professor of anesthesiology from Duke, as it must be pronounced, uh, where he's also executive vice chairman. Uh, he's also the lead for EBPOM USA, so he's very well placed to uh, give us a picture on um, well, uh, parative medicine uh, from the US uh, standpoint. It's a pleasure to welcome a friend, colleague and mentor from Southampton, Mike Grocott, who amongst other roles uh, is the chair of the Parative Medicine Group at the Royal College of Anethis, uh, which in effect means he's um, entirely responsible for delivering POM within the UK. Uh, so no pressure. Uh, Mike has been known to say, quote, uh, I'm all over it like a rash, so that's fine. So, um, we'll take some questions from the floor. I think we've got We've either got mics or uh, not, so we'll get you to shout out. Um, I'll just kick off by asking each of the uh, presenters. It strikes me that a a key part of the success of imperative medicine actually working on the ground is around the the integration piece, really. And I think that's there are so many stakeholders and there are so many work streams going on. How do we ensure that actually this looks like a joined up bit of work to patients uh, and doesn't stay in, in little silos. Any volunteers? Um. One thing, is, I think you do it on a case-by-case basis. What, one of the, if we worry about there being a standard model at the coalface for how anaesthetists and surgeons and physicians and everyone else works together, uh, I don't think there ever, there ever will be one. There are surgeries, so head and neck surgery, typically, in my experience, the surgeons are incredibly focused on the whole journey. They have long cases, so few patients, and so they're, they're all over the nutrition and the smoking cessation and everything else. They're, they're, they probably don't need perioperative physicians. And there are other extremes, and I'm not going to take a pop at the orthoped, orthopods because there is actually an orthopedic surgeon in the audience, or there was earlier in the week, and he's, he's feeling a bit bruised. But, um, but typically, the, the orthopods, we have high volume, relatively low complexity <coughs> procedures in terms of the perioperative care are not interested and are delighted when we take over and then there's a whole spectrum in the middle so I think the coalface model has to depend on the types of surgery the individuals involved some folk are more more or less interested and 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 be based around doing the right thing for the patient Uh, I think it's got to be you know within the hospital there will be some groups that will get it and others that won't and it's got to be locally solution, local solutions, and each hospital will be different too. Mm. Um, and uh, but I, I think promulgating that general vision that uh, of legitimising the idea that the traditional way of doing surgery isn't working, that you've get, got to have a system for pulling it all together. And whoever actually runs that and is the core person on the ground doesn't really matter as long as you. Know, that you've got to work out the solution that works for you. Mm. I, I would just add, um, obviously we're early in um, our curve to, to understand um, that. One of the things that we've tried to do, um, sometimes very successfully, sometimes with um, you know less success, is we are agnostic to specialists. When we, we have something we call POET, another acronym, it's the um, perioperative enhancement team. Um, it's warm and fuzzy, and everybody can identify with that. And there's no um, shout out to any one particular um, area being more relevant than the other. It's a, you know a group of people who have a common interest in just enhancing the value of the perioperative journey. Um, we have hematologists on the team. We have neurologists on the team. I have internists on the team. I have geriatricians on the team, and everyone is invited if they have an idea that um, is worth hearing um, to to sort of move that ball down the road. And and 
Um, it, it's, you know, it's a complex um, journey. It, it's not just medicine, though that's a core part of it. It's also implementation science. And for that, we also have finance in the room and we have operation expertise in the room. And um, I, I have a two-hour meeting every Monday. It's a steering committee where we literally just review uh, things that we've launched things that we're thinking about launching, um, crazy ideas that are just twinkles in our eye, but it, it's, a, it's a free uh, meeting for anybody to come to. I just wonder if we, we obviously talk a lot about POM leadership and who's taking responsibility for those patients. I also think, uh, as we've looked at POM, uh, we realize there's these groups of basically administrative staff that seem to have a fantastic overview of the patient journey and actually unwittingly uh, wield a lot of power in terms of you know what that pa- patient pathway looks like. I just wonder if we actually need to uh, perhaps worry less about you know who's leading and actually just uh, develop this kind of army of, of good administrative staff members that are actually good at taking that overview uh, and, and actually gluing everything together so that the patient experience is right. So I'm, I'm going to jump in and just say I, I strongly agree with that point of view. I I, um, I think we're lucky in that we. Um, out of the box adapted that point of view and it's been invaluable. I cannot imagine having had the successes that we've had or or plan to manage the gaps that we've identified without having that, that competency in the room. Uh, Ross? Yes, but... Yes, but. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, and... <laughs> I'm being coached about. That's right. How's it going? Yes, and I think you also need to build that. Everybody needs to understand that even if they're enacting decisions uh, and acting at a higher level than they used to, that there is someone that they can fall or flick the case to to sort things out when things get really difficult or get really sticky. Um, and something magical happens when you turn about 50 and your hair goes grey and all of a sudden people treat you with respect and yeah and when things go really bad and you walk into the room with three or four other people and all the eyes are on you and but those people are really obviously I've been in that situation a few times but I think having people who are prepared to take that role is really important um, and yeah I think a really important element of your question was the pathway word. Mm. Because in some respects, you can define uh, us with surgery and one or two other specialties as quite distinct from other medical specialties in, in that we're, we're all about pathways. Mm. And, and so Sol's analogy of the you know, takeoff, flight, landing, which we've traditionally thought of as sort of induction of anesthesia, sleep, wake up, actually works with contemplation of surgery to full recovery. And, and it's a different... Uh, it's a different type of engagement with a patient than the, than the chronic ill health doctors who have the very well-informed patients. It, it's a different relationship and a different pattern. And actually thinking about ourselves as pathway doctors and healthcare providers may be important. Just to, to, to sort of um, harness, if you will, all the opinions um, to be, you know, essentially a, a same expression... I, Smoking cessation is a population health issue that obviously has great impact on the patients that we see in, in the paraphernalia uh, domain. It, the, that chronic relapsing disease doesn't go away, and what we do before they are having surgery is, is not a hard stop. In other words, we, we have a system right now where I, I have clinics all throughout the triangle, all throughout a three-county area around Duke Hospital, and we're, we're engaging with primary care physicians to, you know, stand up more. And those are all a feeder groups from once we identify that need to touch that patient's, you know, uh, issue. So I, I do think as a, as a uh, physician with a focused um, expertise in, in perioperative medicine, as we heretofore have defined it, not to respect that broader, if you will, breadth of competencies, mm-hmm. just limits our ability to do awesome things. And, and, and it's not to say that there's, there's not um, a point of, of uh, um, resolution when there's a, a cognitive, re, you know, responsible difference of opinion. But, but I think you have to bring smart people into the room to make you better. Oli, Ross, Southampton, yeah. you've been waiting a little while. Um, so do you, do you see this initiative as being um, something that could be truly global? How do you see uh, 
this all the work that's been done in Australia and America and the UK and other places kind of translating itself or having or being adaptable for obviously low and middle income countries inevitably I'm going to ask this because there are discussion this morning in my area of interest but clearly this is stuff that could make an enormous difference to the kind of fire that is basically raging out there you know we're in our city everything's not too bad where we are and it's a, it's a pretty bad out there and how do you how do you see engaging have you been, you presumably been approached by leaders in other other countries who have their own institutions where they want to set this up for their high level stuff but how do you see that working for kind of across the kind of low and middle income kind of type areas Ross yeah. thanks thanks for asking that because I, I think that's a really interesting discussion uh, and my understanding I've had I had some exposure to you know, un- less developed uh, health situations, very young and virtually nothing since. But my understanding from my reading is that the same messages apply, that there is a lot of preventable morbidity, mortality and costs associated with poor patient preparation and poor post-operative care. Uh, and it's seen as a low-value area, Um, The surgeons tend to focus uh, on what's going on in the operating theatre uh, and then the patients are falling apart on the wards, um, same as they are for us, uh, albeit with different resource implications. But I think if we can get that message out there uh, and to some extent that question about do you train medical anaesthetists or medical anaesthesia providers, maybe we need to have medical perioperative specialists regardless of who's actually you know, in the operating theatre doing the procedure. And it rings bells very clearly with the experience of the Australian hero surgeon uh, called Fred Hollows, who was an ophthalmic surgeon. Um, but famously, he uh, worked in Nepal and in Eritrea, and I'm not sure whether it was where, exactly where it was, but he realised that he shouldn't bother doing the cataract surgery because he was much better off supervising the clinics and setting up the systems and literally trained non-nursing, non-technical, virtually kids straight out of school, generally younger women, because they've got the finer, finer dexterity to do the actual cataract surgery. He said that wasn't the difficult thing. The, the overall system was, was um, more important for his um, charisma and expertise and all that. And I, and I think getting out this message that perioperative medicine is a paradigm that applies very much in what, even in resource constrained situations is a very important uh, thing. So. It's a really interesting question, not just for um, its direct surface implications, but I, as Ross was answering it, I was actually thinking that um, obviously you, you have, it's situational and conditional and you have to uh, appreciate the priorities and, and establish a way to, to find those priorities and, and, and begin to chisel away at um, change. Um, and, and a big bang isn't always feasible. Um, but, but it's also a cultural transformation. And, and I was thinking, um, though you compared the states or Australia or uh, the UK to um, less developed, if you will, regions of the world. I would argue within the United States there are, there are institutions and hospitals that are very um, um, comfortable and, and, and able to, if you will, take that sort of bold leap. And there are institutions that are scratching and clawing to survive. And, and, and it's not even an international, national sort of analogy, but it's, it's a regional one. And, and so what we've done to teach those other programs that aren't willing to have the vision or able to have the vision to take that that leap um, is is just to do their own internal sort of gap analysis, their own soul searching of where uh, can you begin to implement change and then and then build off of those small victories and it would be the same answer I would have for the the more international per- perspective that, that you just described I mean, the, the basic principles of the so shared decision making and uh, improving, you know, altering adverse health behaviours, managing comorbidities before elective surgery and, and reliable, consistent care after surgery. It doesn't really matter who does them uh, or, or what your exact system is, but the principles, I think, are still useful. And we have, we've tended to focus on the procedure and maybe sometimes forget the penumbra. Any other questions from the floor? Uh, Ollie. 
Do you, I just wanted to ask, do you think the value proposition for perioperative medicine has been sufficiently made? Because my impression, certainly in sort of the local institutions where I work, is that if you, the main barriers to setting up a good perioperative medicine service are uh, lack of resources and lack of money. So if you say to managers, we'd like to set up a more comprehensive perioperative service that will include more of our high-risk surgical population, the response is, well who's going to pay for it, Who, that needs more staff, it needs more resources, and there's not, a sort of, there's not a sufficient evidence base to persuade them that that will save money in the long run. Do you think that's something that perioperative medicine needs to address a bit more? My impression from you, Sol, was that that's, that's a case that's kind of accepted in the, in the States. Well, it, it's not accepted. It was argued um, compellingly. And, and so it's a really important question because we, we are in that frame of, reference where um, value has to be demonstrated. The, the, the argument I would make, the argument I have made, and the argument I continue to make is um, the easy wins are those areas where you can, in a first order sort of account, cost accounting model, tease out a, a contribution margin. If you um, take care of a patient and you send them to another specialist who's currently being able to receive some remuneration for what they do and, and perhaps even get paid for a, a procedure that's associated with that. There's a, there's a technical fee and there's a professional fee and that's cost accounting, contribution margin, and that's very easy to do. And, and of course we do that and that's really boring and not the answer. Um, but we do it. The real answer is, is to address the, the reality that we're evolving to a risk-based, value-based economy for healthcare. Here's 10 bucks. If you can do it for nine, keep one. If you can do it for 11, um, I'm sorry. And, and, and that's why we're in such a, I think, very interesting place right now. So it's not contribution margin accounting, it's cost avoidance accounting. And so you have to make the case, and you can do this, it's a very difficult, it's much more complex and a difficult calculus, but you have to do the cost avoidance calculation, and that's where you show the value proposition. Um, you know, we, we are in a state right now where the um, transformation to risk has accelerated very, very quickly, crazy fast, and it's competitive, as the free market would, you know, have us um, um, live with, and, and we, we as an institution are realizing we have to change the way we do things because whereas in the past you could get paid for the plane that crashed, now you have to eat that. And so we're very motivated to, to make sure that plane doesn't land until the wheels are down. Ross, you're shaking your head. <laughs> uh, there's just a menorah of things like this. I think I've just heard an MBA in the space <laughs> of two minutes. But um, the, the overall thing, I think, you're right. I think the value, the message hasn't got out there. And perhaps, or well, certainly in Australia, I'm not sure about the... Uh, it's probably in the NHS from what I've seen as well. Uh, it has been implemented at a local level and people have seen, oh, yeah, by you know, making this deal about you know, doing this, then we can bring in most patients on the day. And that's been easy. But I think getting the higher-level bureaucracy and health economists to understand what it's all about, I don't think we've done that well. And certainly one of the things that the college in Australia is doing is a pretty you know, high-level health economic analysis as a foundation for getting that message out there. And if you like, the target audience isn't the hospital business managers at a local level. It is at a higher level than that. Uh, so at the government levels, at mid-government levels, high government levels... Uh, and for the health insurers, so that they start putting the pressure on the hospitals to, look, have you sorted this out at a local level, um, and reinforcing the message. So, and and in just, I mean, so our context, the bundled payments is about where you're getting to at the moment. I know capitation may come. Our, our context in terms of healthcare funding is moving towards true capitation, i.e. Uh, here, Surrey, have a billion quid and just sort it out. So everything, public, social, uh, you know, social care, primary care, secondary care, is all, all in the same basket. We're not, we're not there yet, but the, the experiments are heading in that direction. And uh, so the avoidance of ineffective surgery is a massive win because that's, you're spending a lot of money achieving nothing or potentially adding cost. Uh, the, the nudges that we can do 
because uh, primary care is so overwhelmed that many uh, patients essentially uh, engage with us or perioperative care as their specialist physician for the first time. So the nudges around chronic disease management, you know, diabetes, anemia, atrial fibrillation, etc., I think are enormous. And then and the you know, prehabilitation, long-term behavioural change, and that impact on population health are all potentially massive. At the moment, the shared decision-making is the easy win because that works at an institutional level, but the, the others work at a system level, and that's where I think we're going. And I, and I, I think it'll be a relatively easy win. And so, I mean, certainly at the moment, the STPs are very... I mean, they're all over peril to medicine. So uh, I'm going to defer any further comments and discussions to a nice cup of tea. Uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, join me in thanking all our uh, speakers for this Raymond Jerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.